Hi everyone! Um, it's been a while since we've done these lecture videos, but um, this is going to be starting off our unit on population density. Okay, um, just to define a population, this is something that we've discussed before in class, but remember it's a group of individuals of a same species that occupies the same area. So it's a little bit more specific than just species. It's a species, but a month, the individuals within the species has to live in the same area. Um, so usually members of a population are going to share the same resources. Um, they're able to interact with each other, and they can also breed with each other. And population ecology is the study of how um, this population size changes over time and the factors that affect the population size change. Um, and so reasons why we might want to study population ecology um, to ensure um, how to preserve endangered species. This is really important for understanding human dynamics and human population growth. Um, this is important for um, understanding the ecological impact of human activity on the biosphere. So there's just a lot of applications for population ecology. Okay, so population density is a, num um, a measure of looking at the number of individuals of a species per area. So we're looking at how dense the population is. Um, so aside from density, you can also consider uh, the dispersion of the individuals within a given area. So looking at how those individuals are spaced out um, can tell us a lot about um, social patterns. It can also tell us about distribution of resources. Um, the first kind of dispersion pattern we see is clumped, clumped dispersion. And this is when you see um, groups of individuals that are clustered together in little pods. And there's a space and there's a little pod. Um, this is the most commonly noticed in nature. Um, and the reason why that is is because very often in nature we have an unequal distribution of resources. Um, and so thus, like the individuals will cluster in the area um, where the resources are. Um, other reasons why we might see clumped distribution is because of social behavior. So um, animals that like to congregate together will do so. Um, and there's a lot of advantages for this. So this can help survive, help the species survive. Um, for example, it can reduce the risk of predation uh, or being attacked by predators. Uniform dispersion is a different form of dispersion, and that's when um, it's a little bit difficult to see this picture, but there's relatively equal spacing between all of the individuals. Um, and this tends to be seen in more um, um, behavior, this kind of behavior is seen as like a social or territorial type of behavior. Um, it can also be seen in plants um, that may create chemicals to keep um, the plants separated from each other. The last one is random dispersion, and this is when you just see random scattering um, this picture right here, I think it's supposed to be dandelions, those little yellow weed flowers that you see outside. And the reason why they're so randomly dispersed is often because their dispersal methods of the seeds is like very random. Like it depends on wind or tracking with animals or something. Okay, so shifting gears now to survivorship. So not just talking about population, but how those populations grow and survive over time. Um, this is an example of a life table. And a life table just tells you information about um, how many members of that species or population is alive at a certain time, uh, point in time, and generally um, the number of deaths that happen. And you can use both the, the number alive and the number of deaths to calculate the overall um, life expectancy and the different rates here. So the life table is important just because it helps us create a survivorship curve. And the survivorship curve is when we plot out um, the proportion of individuals that are alive at each age. So if you look at this graph, the bottom is life expectancy. And on this y-axis, we see number of individuals. So um, increasing in time of the individual or the population's age, how many members of that population are still alive? And so you can notice there's three different kinds of um, survivorship curves. Um, type 1, which is seen in large mammals and humans, um, this is when there are not so many offspring that are born, but the ones that are born are well taken care of and therefore have a very high chance of surviving into maturity. So a lot of those that are born is almost 100% survival, and then it starts to plateau off as um, the population ages. The second one is 
um, seen here in this red line. Uh, we've seen it in rodents and lizards and birds. These are kinds of uh, creatures where the individuals are equally vulnerable to death at every point in their life. So the young are not necessarily more likely to die than the old. They kind of equal chance. If you're a young bird, you're likely to die at the same rate as an older bird. And the last one is type 3, which you see in this one. So these are characterized by invertebrates and plants. Um, these are just generally species that tend to have a lot of offspring, but do not um, take care of the offspring. And so because they have a lot of offspring and don't take care of them, there's a very low survival rate of the offspring. Um, what does tend to happen is that the uh, many of the offspring die, but the ones that do survive past a certain um, age, they tend to have a higher chance of survival. Notice that the difference here is not very much, and so um, the percentage change is very little. So if you survive up to this point, you're most likely to survive for the full lifespan. Okay, so we can use different models to predict the growth of populations. Um, and just to give you some background, increase in population size is due both to birth and also to immigration. And that's because we're looking at population as in a specific area. So if um, things, uh, different members of the same species enter into that area, we consider that a growth in population size. Conversely, decrease in population size is either due to death or emigration. So if species leave or if they die off in that area, then it's a decrease in size. So how can we predict rate of population growth? Um, the first one is exponential growth model. This is also called the J-curve or J-shaped curve. And this is just um, an ideal form of population growth um, that is assuming that there's no restriction on abilities to live, grow, or reproduce. And so over time, you see that the species just keeps on exponentially increasing because the babies keep on having more children, the offspring keep on having more offspring, and so there's no limit to this growth. And so this mathematical model, G equals Rn, characterizes the exponential growth model. Um, G represents the growth rate. And R right here is the per capita rate of increase. Um, so that tells you the maximum amount of reproduction per individual. So how much can one individual in that population kind of contribute on average to the growth? Um, and so to calculate R, it's just the births minus the deaths, births plus immigration minus deaths minus immigration. Um, divided by n. So that's um, the total change divided by the population size. And n is equal to the population size. So if you look at it, g is really just equal to the change in population, which is births plus immigration minus deaths minus immigration. The second model is called the logistic growth model, or the S-shaped curve. Um, and so this is a much more realistic kind of model. And it's based on the idea that there are limiting factors, um, which are environmental factors that uh, prevent maximum population growth. Um, and this leads to something called the carrying capacity. Um, the carrying capacity is the maximum population that the environment can sustain. And so what happens is um, it tends to start off the, as a J-shaped curve. So when the population is small, and there is, it looks like exponential uh, growth, but when it hits a certain point, the growth starts to slow down as the population gets to the size where it's approaching its um, carrying capacity. And once it reaches its carrying capacity, it doesn't grow anymore. And so this can be predicted by um, this mathematical model, g equals r times n, and then times this extra factor, which is k minus n divided by k. Um, so growth uh, G, R, and N are still the same as the previous model. And the only difference here is K, which represents the carrying capacity. So for those of you guys who are good at math, you can see that um, as K, as um, N is very small, so over here at the beginning of the curve, when N is really small, um, K, it, it, uh, this part of the equation essentially becomes K minus a very small number divided by K. This is effectively one. And then you have what looks like exactly like the exponential growth model, g equals rn. But as k becomes, as n grows and approaches k, at this point, let's say n equals k, k minus k equals zero. And so growth overall is going to equal zero because this is zero, zero times this would be zero. 
So there's zero growth. Um, notice that overall, um, the overall growth is small, both when the carrying po um, population size is close to population uh, carrying capacity, and also at the very beginning when the population size is really small. The reason why this is uh, very little growth is because of what we talked about, where k is n is equal to essentially k, and this cancels out. But the reason why this over here, the population growth is pretty small, is because your n is so small that um, uh, your growth is overall small. You don't have very many individuals to have offspring, and so your overall growth is going to be small. Um, and mathematically, that makes sense because this is going to be like 1, but n, if it's a small number, is going to make g overall small. So this is kind of just the background for population, um, and we will discuss this more in class. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.